Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. You're listening to another special episode of the Ultra OCR Man Commentary. And again, I'm joined by Bobby Ross. Bobby, say hi. Hey, yo. What's going on, everybody? And tonight's extra special because normally we do audio only, but I'm in a hotel room recording and my internet's faster. And now I can see Bobby's beautiful face and everyone's missing out on it. This is fantastic. I love seeing my face. (laughs) So we're going to pick up where we left off after the last episode. So we're going to be talking about primarily chapters 10, 11, probably just 10 and 11. There's a lot there, man. There's so much there. So 10 is all about OCR America and 11 is about ultra OCR Grand Slam. So kind of from this point forward in the book, we kind of start getting into the one big yearly challenge I do uh, to raise money for Folds of Honor, Uh, you know, scholarship money for children whose parents were cold and wounded in action. Chapter 10 starts off the first one, OCR America. That was my first big event. And honestly, you know, there was a lot of fear going into that one, right? Because when you normally do a race, like the only people who really cares a lot is you. And even if, you know, even if you go and you're someone relatively well-known in the, in the racing industry, right? And you bomb it, you know, people might talk about it, but it, it becomes background noise, right? Like for OCR America, I was literally the only participant going to every day. And like, I had blasted it on social media and (laughs) mud run guide and all these, like all these resources. So like if I failed personally, it would have been very embarrassing for me, you know? (laughs) And it's not like, oh, well, you're definitely going to finish, right? Like that was, it was seven days, seven obstacle course race marathons. And um, I I told my boss the idea when I was in Lebanon, because right before I announced it. General dad, man. Yeah. And he was like, is can you do that? Like, are, are you gonna be able to do that? And I was like, uh, I was like, I think so. And he's like, oh, I don't know about that. And I was like, Oh, geez. Dude, I gotta say, uh, I, I was not there for this event. I was there for the sequel, which I, I guess we're foreshadowing a little bit. That's not in this book. But OCR America Two was when I got to like spend that week with you. And when I first heard about it, I gotta honestly say, since I had known you'd done it before, like the first time, I don't think I, I could could fathom the amount of work that it would be. <laughs> like seven days, of, not just marathons. Like it's easy to imagine a marathon, I guess. I guess it's easier to imagine a marathon than multi-lapping an obstacle course. There's just, it's it takes so long to do. And the mental grit, I don't know how you did it. I don't know why you would have done it a second time. <laughs> and I don't know how you did it in the summer. Like th- it's a... It is an immense amount of work. And for anybody who is sitting there thinking, yeah, I could do that. Or eh, that's not too bad. If you could do one marathon, you could do seven. No, the toll on your body from day to day is amazing. Yeah, they get exponentially It's massive, harder. dude. It's cool. They get exponentially harder. And, you know, a lot of things that they just continue to wear on you, right? So if you have something that's bothering you on day two and it starts bothering you after 20 miles, you know, on day three, it's going to bother you after 15. On day four, it's going to bother you after 10. Day five, it's going to bother you after five, right? Like, and then... <laughs> And then it's yeah. going to hurt all the time, right? So you just kind of, you just got to turn off parts of your brain and, you know, keep moving forward. And yeah, the first one was really challenging. I, the, we had a different pit crew uh, compared to, like Bobby said, with the second one. The summer wasn't too bad because most of the days weren't too hot. There was a couple of, of really hot days, but actually the weather, weather was pretty good versus OCR America too. You know, just being outside was kind of miserable. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's, <laughs> it's 10 degrees out. <laughs> It's It's like, this is not very fun. (laughs) How was, I want to ask you this and, and I don't, I don't want to like dictate where we go in this chapter early on, but I do want to like ask you a little bit about how did your feet feel? Because like it's, it's the summertime. There's a lot of mud. There's a lot of heat. Did you have like trench foot or anything like that? Like was like, like skin sloughing off of your feet, man. From the military, you know, we go to ranger school and your feet are wet almost 24 hours a day. So I think I just got used to it. I mean, it, your feet are all wrinkled and they, they're kind of gross and um, you'll get some blisters, but typically the blisters will pop and then they'll, they'll kind of harden. So you just kind of go through that, that cycle real quick and just kind of <laughs> keep walking. But yeah, my feet were pretty gross and my hands were tore up pretty good, right? Like my hands in OCR America too were fine because I was wearing gloves almost the whole time uh, because it was, it was freezing out. So uh, that actually protected my hands a lot better. Feet were rough. What was one of the things that wasn't in this book? I can't remember what day it was, but we went to the. I was climbing over stuff, right? And you're climbing over all these wooden things, and I'm wearing, you know, spandex or like marina compression tights. 
And we get back to the hotel and I'm like, oh, I'm like, my inner thigh is kind of itching. So me and my, uh, you know, my best friend, Stye, are in the hotel room. And I'm like, you know, I'm sitting there with like my legs spread. And we've got <laughs> tweezers and I've got splinters, these little like thorns or splinters in my thighs. I pulled like, I don't know how many out, five or eight. I, I don't remember. But I just remember being like, oh, there's something on my leg. And then I started pulling. And then I was like, this is, this is long. <laughs> you know, this is not like... It wasn't just, it wasn't like a speck. It was, it was, it, you know, it wasn't like an inch, but it was, uh, I mean, it was noticeable, right? It was like, I remember pulling it out and being surprised at how long it was. I was like, oh, that what's been in my leg all day. That's weird. So. Oh man. It's yep. insane. The sorts of things that like, you think about it, like you do one race in one day and you're like, yeah, this hurts. And then the next day you're like, yeah, I'm super sore. This hurt. Oh, that sucked. You have to go out and just race again the next day. Yeah. So you that could have been in there for days. Your brain is like just like all hopped up on adrenaline. Yeah, um, we're pretty sure it was one day though, because uh, Sly had a couple in his legs too. Oh, I got you. And you kind of mentioned that it was it was just interesting that you know in, in race, and I talk about a little this about this a little bit in the book, but you know in a race you you kind of blunt the plane the pain you not you ignore it while you're racing. Uh, for OCR America, it was the same thing, except because it was a, essentially a seven day event, I was basically like ignoring or like trying to ignore all the pain for seven days. And after the last day, when I went back in the hotel and took a nap, and then I woke up, I felt so bad. Like, because my, bo- my <laughs> body finally was like, all right, you can relax. You don't have to do anything anymore. And everything hurt. Like, I couldn't walk. I felt like I'd been hit by a truck. So It's, a, it's an insane event, and I can't wait for the next one. Oh, no, no. <laughs> OCR America 3. <laughs> I don't have any other ideas uh, for OCR America. You know so. what? It, it will be when hell is at a moderate temperature, because we'll <laughs> yeah. do it in like the fall or the spring. <laughs> <laughs> not the summer or the winter it's, it's, for some reason that doesn't have the same ring to it you know you gotta <laughs> you gotta like up the ante and uh so i, I thought upping the ante from going from summer to winter was good but i don't i don't think spring or fall really does you go fall. from there uh, you'll come up with something i know i've got some good ideas not necessarily yeah, osir america but I've you can write been. horror films dude i used to when i when i was little i wanted to write horror films we no made way. Some, yeah, because I was a, I was a horror fanatic growing up. Wow, a little a little alternate version of you grew up to be me. Yes, hundred <laughs> percent. Nice, dude. And one thing I I liked was hearing about the Iron Cowboy. What like kind of like got you started with this idea? Like got the got the gears turning. The ideas I've come up with an ultra or an OCR and an ultra OCR essentially are, I'm I'm just stealing them from other sports, right? Like I'm not super original, <laughs> like. I, I've looked at what other people do in other sports. And I'm like, well, OCR should have that too. And it's like, oh, well, no one's going to do it. I'm going to do it. And that's basically what I did. You know, Dean Carnazes did 50 states, 50 marathons, 50 days for, right, which for ultra running or marathon running. James Lawrence did 50 Ironman, 50 states, 50 days, which I thought was physically impossible. I thought you'd physically run at a time. And have you heard about his new, his new thing? No. He's, he's called, he calls it Conquer 100. He's doing 100 Ironman in 100 days. I think the difference is though he's not he's not traveling around the U.S. I think he's staying in one location and doing them. A hundred, which I also don't think is possible. But I was no. also wrong last time, so I'm probably going to be wrong this time. Got to be a stunt. That guy can't like. There's like no way. Yeah. So that's you're going to do it with him? No. <laughs> uh, I think it starts. It starts in like another month or two. It's it's pretty it's it's pretty close in the future, right? You obviously, you need to go up and see that one day. He's been prepping for it for a while, obviously. Um, you don't just you don't just wing that. But. <laughs> we got to go up and see it. We got to go for one day. Yeah, I think he's in Utah. I'm not sure where he is. Oh, gross! Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Something I saw was that uh, Sty. You said like generally ran at. You said at least one lap, which means that there were days where he only ran one lap. We were running with you constantly every day at OCR America too. Was that because you had so many participants? I think we had more participants for OCR America too, uh, minus New Noob Sanity Day. New Sanity, we had a lot of people for OCR America one. And then other than that, I mean, Sty had he was the primary driver, so he did most of the driving. And then my my wife never paced me. My dad never paced me. I'm gonna say this in a nice way. <laughs> I brought some dead weight last time. <laughs> <laughs> pacing duties for pacing duties right i loved having i, I did i loved having my daughter there i loved having my wife there um i love my having my dad there he was 
uh, there, obviously, the second time, too. But, you know, for pacing duties, we brought some people who just didn't do, didn't do pacing. So you guys, you guys did a lot more pacing than I was expecting. And you guys came out for a lot of voluntarily laps that you didn't necessarily have to come out for. Right. Well, we also didn't know if we would be able to tell if you had died because some of the, the laps were really long. So like if you were just like sitting in like a, a snow drift or like kind of like unconscious at the bottom of a hill at any point, we like the laps were so long because it was so like the, the conditions were so bad. We were like, how are we going to know when to go out after it? That's true. We're like, you know, it's just too cold. You don't think about this stuff, right? But I mean, there are so many things that can go wrong. Just so many things, right? I mean, you've, we've been to races, right? Brenna Calvert was running down in Cincinnati at Battle Frog. Took a wrong, took a, like a hard fall, basically like broke her knee. I mean, this is back in 2015, right? So, I mean, you, you can hurt yourself pretty bad. And even on OCR America 2, on day one, on like mile 10, I'm doing one of the rigs in um, – obstacle athletics and i reach for the next hold and instead of my finger going on top of the hold it goes through the tiny carabiner that's above the hold right so if i would have pulled down and let my weight fall on it i would have broken my like my finger would have taken a 90 degree turn and i would have broken my finger well your whole weight's on it right yeah i mean if i would have if i would have let go but because i've been doing so much racing i felt it go in and i immediately just pulled it straight back out with like my hand extended and I was fine, but it's, it's little stuff like that you don't necessarily think about that could cause a serious problem on yourself. And then, you know, honestly, you're just driving, driving all these distances, right? Like what happens if you get a flat tire? What happens if you get to a car accident? What happens if you run off the road, right? There's, there's, there's a lot of possibilities of things that can go wrong. So I think it's easy to look back in hindsight and be like, oh, well, of course you'd, you'd finish. But like, it's, it was really uncertain. And even for OCR America too, also, with the wintertime conditions, right? I mean, we didn't know what the we didn't know what the weather was going to be, right? When yeah. when I when I printed the medals for OCR America too, they don't have a date on them. It was purposeful. <laughs> so I was like, well, what if we do two days and we're just snow, we're just stuck in, inside and it's we're snowed in, you know? So, well, and OCR America too started off with a couple of gym days, yeah, or at did. least one, yeah. At at that point, we were like, well, this isn't too bad, you know, like uh. You know, the, the running is outside and it's cold, but the obstacles are inside. And that was really great because, you know, it was climate controlled. It's like it, we could always like the, the laps were short. So we could, we could always have someone else like rotate in for us. It wasn't until we got to, uh, to New York and noob sanity that it really kind of dawned to us that, Oh, the rest of this week is going to be really hard and really yeah. dangerous. You talk about some of those things that happened in the first OCR America that were really dangerous in the book and you know the first one it was all outside so i was using all obstacle courses we didn't use any gyms because at the time there was more permanent obstacle course race venues that were open and then i also again because it's the summer you had we had the option to do live events which was super cool right so i started at tough mudder new england which is literally the worst tough mudder i could have picked but it's the only one that fit into the schedule (laughs) and i finished at conquer the gauntlet uh oklahoma city which is the best ending right it was yeah awesome hometown yeah or close to it something i loved was you talked about your training regimen you said um the plan was to sign up for every battle frog extreme within driving distance where instead of racing them you were just going to use my training runs uh you run high volume and you did four of these seven plus hour races in the same month i think it was actually three was it, did I, was I, it? I think it was three i did four in like oh three of which were in the same month yeah yeah i did four and i think it was like two two months or five and two or something like that but yeah, it was just, I think the, the, the thing is with most physical feats, it's a matter of previous experience and scale, right? So if I run 10 miles, going on a five mile run doesn't seem so far. If I've run 20 miles, going on a 10 mile run doesn't seem so far. So what I was doing was kind of numbing myself to running for eight hours a day or seven hours a day by signing up for a lot of uh, BFXs. And you'll see in the book, I like this is purposeful. Like I, I'm, I'm doing this year after year. So I'm, I'm numbing myself, right? So I, for 2016, I made, you know, doing six or eight hour OCRs not seem like a big deal. And then I did ultra uh, OCR America too, 2017, which we'll get to in a minute. I did all the 24 hour OCRs I could essentially in a year, kind of numb myself to the 24 hour distance. And then in 2018, I, I tried to do a 48 hour one, right? So 
it's stepping stones and this the same logic can be applied to whatever your fitness level is right you you gradually build the thing is that most people reach a certain point and they just stop right they go all right i've done you know let, let's say your goal is to do a half marathon they're like i did my half marathon i'm done i've block checked let me move on to other things you know there's a saying in the military it's like always improve your fighting position right you, so you're always trying to get better um you're always trying to make things a little bit better and that's what i've been doing for my endurance right so i'm always trying to push that envelope a little bit farther and have i ever reached the end of the envelope mm, i don't know i'm getting pretty close i'm getting pretty <laughs> close where like i don't really have a desire to see how much further i can go um right but, but and, and everyone everyone hits that limit at some point right everyone hits that limit you know whether you're james lawrence doing 100 ironmans in 100 days doing one marathon and calling it a day right like everyone has their limit it's just a matter of where that that line is well you've got a lot of life left to do and uh there's more to life than just running races <sighs> it's true. not a whole lot but a little bit yeah <laughs> that's crazy man i i just i thought it was really fun that what you basically did was train the mental and the physical uh, almost independently, right? Like, like you knew that you had like the physical ability to run one of these races, but it almost seems like putting everything that close together, choosing the timelines that you did was, just, it was even more of a mental stretch than a physical one. Definitely played a, a huge role in it. Absolutely. And the ability to run for eight to 10 hours a day, uh, climbing over things and then getting up and doing it again. It's rough. I remember being on day three and being like, I remember finishing day three of OCR America one and be like, I'm not even a halfway there yet. Like, geez, you know, just being exhausted because it, the first couple of days were, were hard. Uh, we had the Tough Mudder, which is on the side of a mountain. So it was a mountain course. Shale Hell is a, I wish you would have seen Shale Hell, Bobby. It is a, <laughs> it is awful. There are so many obstacles. There's so many obstacles on that course. It, it's rough. And then day three was designed by Rob Butler, the same guy who does Shale Hill. Right. So they're, I'm going to say they're watered down, but they're not right. I, it like they're watered down compared to shell hell, but they're, they're not watered down compared to any other OCR in the United States. That one has a lot of obstacles too. So, and then we finally got to noob sanity and then you've seen noob sanity, right? The, that's not an easy day. Noob sanity is something. Noob sanity is, is way different from any place else that I've been because it, it feels like an institution. I mean, if anybody hasn't been to, to meet the Noob Sanity crew, not only is are the Jarrett's absolutely insane. They're insane. Just like not normal human. Like I feel scared around both of them and in a good way. <laughs> in a good way because they're, they're all together on a different level as far as like just challenging one another and like one-upping yes. one another and seeing how crazy they can be. And they've built a community there. At you know their their courses, those two courses next to one another at their house, where people come and they just like say, "All right, cool. I'm gonna take my shoes off. I'm gonna take my shirt off. It's 15 degrees, negative 15 degrees out here. It's the middle of the night, and we're just all gonna run laps until one of us decides we don't want to anymore." It's like that insane. Like they're they're that dedicated to it, and it's an incredibly fun environment. And it feels like the course has grown around that sense of community of, of challenging and pushing. And you go out on some of these obstacles and not only are they difficult and large, but they're inventive. They've got lots of, uh, of different complex pieces. I remember one of them where you had to crawl through, everybody's got like a, a tunnel crawl, but it moves onto like a, a, a high wire beam, I guess. And they're like, like swinging obstacles too in the middle of the forest. And it was just, it's something about that place feels, I feel reverential. Like that's going to like, I don't know. I, I want to just run it. I've never gone to like New York and just run noob sanity, but going with you was, was amazing. I just, I could, I can't speak more highly of the newbies or that place. Yeah, I completely agree. That obstacle you're referring to, they call it area 51. It's mm -hmm. just like a whole bunch of random stuff thrown together. And I definitely want to go back up there and actually one run one of their events competitively. I think they're the best OCR group in the nation right and i'm yeah i'm not just saying that to to puff them up right because i've been i'm from new york i live in kansas city now i've lived in tennessee you know i've been in kcocr world's toughest motor community all, all those different groups right and the new sanity is just tight-knit it's small and like you were saying they, they really just push themselves and you i think you get a lot i think people perform far above what their perceived potential is in that group you know so the you know, the person who's maybe who's not even coming close to the podium but is doing better than what they would thought they would have done. And the person who's 
maybe just off the podium is actually making it onto the podium. The person who's barely making it on the podium is winning, right? So they're, they really push each other. Yeah. And well, and it's insane too, because they're, they're athletes in a, a non-homogenous group, right? Yes. Like, like Jared is a, is a very, like, he looks like an athlete. He's tall, but he's lean. He's, you know, he's built, he's got like that demeanor that like that, but a lot of the other guys who are, who were there are running like multiple laps with us. were just normal looking dudes and girls, you know, yeah. like, like some of whom were like, not, not to be mean or anything, but like some of them were kind of overweight, like some, but they were all tough. Yes, they were all tough. like, yeah, working in with like a ton of grit and a, like you said, performing far beyond what you would think. It's just really cool. Makes me wish I was up there. Me too. Absolutely. Where were we? <laughs> I think well, I we mean, were talking I, about the first. We, we kind of, we've kind of been skipping around, but you know, the Noob Sanity was day four and five. And then day six was the Dirt Runner course, which is where be it Battle Frog Chicago was. The Spartan race used to be there. It's no longer a permanent course, but. Oh, it's not anymore. They, they closed. He's, he took his uh, TK Taki, the owner or the race director, and is now a mobile operation. So they don't, they don't actually use that property anymore, but mm-hmm. I, I, that was the first night we slept in the car and I, you know, it's day six. So I'm almost to the end. It was so hot and the course was not like, it was just very technical footing. Right. So I couldn't run. It was muddy. I was in such a bad mood, you know, you know, I'm just like, and he, he's got so many, he had, so, he also had a lot of obstacles. Right. So like we're on, we're on day six and I'm like, you know, Eventually, it's going to turn into like a warrior dash type thing where the obstacles aren't too bad and I'm just kind of cruising along. But like it just never let up. It was like, you know, I did BFXs to prepare for it because I was like, well, BFX is harder. So when I go do the actual event, it'll be easier. And it wasn't. It was like, it was just like seven (laughs) days of BFXs. And it was just like, what is going on? So it blindsided me pretty good. You know, I, I thought I was going in pretty well prepared. And yeah, I, was, I, I, I did good enough to perform at the level I did, but the obstacle difficulty and the number of actual obstacles I, I completed was, was blindsiding. It was a lot. <laughs> he's, so the, the other funny thing is, so not, he's got some, he's got some pretty uh, obstacles that are a little bit sketchy, um, especially if you're in by themselves, right? So a couple of these long tunnels, they're like, I mean, they're like 50 feet tunnels and you go in and you can't see the, you can't see the end, right? Like, right? Like he's got like a flap over it, so you crawl into the tunnel and it's just pitch black. Is there the one with the water in it too? So yeah, the, the, there's one of that. There's one like that too. At a normal race, right? People run through, and it scares all the bugs. It scares the bugs, scares the frogs away, right? Like, so I'm crawling through these tunnels and like frogs are bouncing off of me, you know. And there's like, <laughs> you're, you're, I mean, you're just eating spider webs to the face. You're like come on you know and then you add the sleep deprivation the tired and the fact that i'm not moving as fast as i want to and it was just like it really eats at you can you take us through the first ah, 15 minutes when you wake up maybe say day three day four of an ocr america and and what's that feel like it feels terrible it's like this was a really bad decision like i've made a series of really poor life choices that have led to this moment and i regret all of them (laughs) And then I kind of, I kind of take that those emotions and be like, all right, well, we're here now, so there's nothing I can do about it. We'll worry about this in a couple of days, you know. And honestly, with all these things, all these endurance events, whether it's a marathon, or OCR America or something, right? You know, when you look at ha- like the span of your entire life, it's just it's literally it's like a flash in the pan, right? Like, I mean, how often do you go through a week and you're like, I can't even remember what I did yesterday? You know, it it, it just goes by so quick. When you're in that moment, it is not going by quick. It is draggingly, it's dragging on forever. But in the long run, it, it's very quick. So I think, you know, I kind of try to use that as a comparison. Again, if you're used to running 10 miles, five miles doesn't seem so far. If I'm thinking about my lifespan, you know, running for a week, day or two days or a week doesn't seem that far because I've been alive a lot longer than a week, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's kind of what you compare it to that makes it uh, easier or harder versus... You know, if I was thinking like, oh, this is like, I'm, I know I'm covering a distance of a marathon, but I'm, it's taking me several times longer, you know, three or four times longer than it should compared to a road marathon. If I compared it to that, then it would be really frustrating and harder, uh, but I don't. I compare it to my life instead of <laughs> instead of a single road marathon yeah. when I'm moving at top speed. 
Basically, the point of all of this is that when you do something like OCR America, like one of these insanely difficult things, it really puts your life into perspective. If you don't have difficult things, then I mean, like you, it's your life is all just like a kind of like a flat line. I flat think we've line, all right. kind of experienced a ton of like a ton of that feeling in 2020. I feel like I spent most of 2020 waiting for the chance to just go back to normal. And it, it was like the longest time I never thought about a, a year has never felt so long and so short at the same time. But something like uh, OCR America, or for, for me, my experience was OCR America too, was like, I have such vivid, me detailed memories of that week. Like there, there are like, I get two or three of those a year, but nothing that was as good as that. Like, you know, like I travel a lot for, for you know, my, my job, not last year, but like normally, <laughs> but, but nothing is that is as memorable as those really difficult days. And I was not doing a quarter of what you were doing, but like, I can, I can see how something like that really gives your life perspective. You see it going from like, what are you comparing it to? Are you comparing it to a normal day or are you comparing it to your, your whole life? Like a week of, of pushing yourself to the extremes is something I think everybody should try. I agree. Yeah. And I think extreme is also a relative term, right? So you don't have to do a seven day, eight day thing, right? Yeah. I mean, like you, like you did with your first marathon, right? I mean, that's a perfect example. So it felt amazing. Like I remember so much about that day. The feeling at the end of it was like, I mean, even though it took me like, I mean, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say it took me over uh, almost five hours to finish that marathon. Yeah. <laughs> but it was at the end of it, it was like, I did that. Like that was mine. Nobody did that for me. Nobody can take that away from me. If I die tomorrow, I will have done something that I thought was impossible. And you've just taken that. So far, <laughs> yeah, it's just all scale. It's all scale. I mean, my first yeah. marathon was four twenty-five, I think. So okay, you're you're not that far behind me. Just start. And I was ten years older, so that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> just start running every day for the next like you know decade or two. So so that's good. It changed it changed the way I saw myself too. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I felt like that. Like there was just about nothing that I could say, yeah, I'm going to do that, that I didn't feel like I could accomplish. Awesome. Yeah. I think that's, uh, I think that's why a lot of endurance sports become addictive for people. Yeah. You, you talked about that later on. It was on, on day two, uh, in the book where he said, sometimes knowing what you'll face is better because you can mentally prepare for it. But other times you should not know. Yeah. <laughs> because sometimes if, if you, if you know how bad it's going to be, it just makes it that much worse. <laughs> you know? So I think we've all experienced that, right? When you start a new job or go to a, your first day of school, something like that where you know everyone's everyone's really nervous and then you go there and it's it's fine right there's it's typically not that bad um versus you know there's other days you know everything goes wrong and if you knew that it was going to be that bad going into that day you'd be like i mean it, it would just eat it eat you up like it's better to go in blindsided sometimes so yeah but you know with the army we move i switch jobs you know every one to three years Typically, it's usually like a year, every year or two, we switch jobs, right? So, you know, I have to do that first day of work thing, like every two years, it sucks, right? Like you're showing up and no one knows who you are. You have to like reestablish who you are. You have to establish that you're like, I'm a hard worker. I'm competent, blah, blah, blah. Versus just like sitting in the same job for 10 or 15 years and just being like, yeah, everyone knows me. I'm the guy who does X, Y, and Z. You know, I've kind of experienced that a lot again from the army. So it's, that's another Kind of carryover lesson. I like that though. Like I appreciate that. I mean, just just being able to re. There's always a feeling of of needing to move forward, a feeling of progress, a feeling of needing to prove yourself. I mean, that's good for people. Yeah. If we get like really, really comfortable. Any final thoughts on OCR America before we jump into? Dude, no, I got. I still got lots of thoughts. Um, oh. You talked about that first, like never again. The end of I think it was uh, it was like day four when you were talking to Brianna. Uh, and the, that happens over and over and over in this book. At what point are you going to stop lying to yourself? I don't know. When are you gonna stop I mean, lying at some point, I've got to stop doing stuff like this. So at some point, it's going to be true. You say that, but like, then you're going to be like, well, but what if I were the oldest guy to ever do this? <laughs> 20 oh, years damn, from now, you're going to be like, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> oh, you got me. You're sucking me back in. I know. Wow. I'm I, hadn't, just... I hadn't considered age. That's a good one. <laughs> Because you can't quit training. Yeah. I didn't think of that. 
there was like this guy, uh, this Australian guy who was, uh, who signed up for an OCR. No, it was, it was a, just an endurance run. It was just like an ultra run. Uh, and he was in his like 60s or 70s, really, really old. Sh- super, super slow, but incredible endurance. Won and kept winning ultras. And, and like, just like started like in the 60s. Oh, wow. you know, like super, he just like, he just didn't get tired. Everybody else would stop and, and, and sleep for a couple of hours. He'd pass everybody when they were asleep. He was like a shepherd. Something like that. He was, he's like, I've been like running after sheep literally my entire life and I never retired. So turns out he was the guy to beat. <laughs> That's wild. Till he died. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good ending to the story. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't run for very long. Oh man. Get that running in early before you die. Listen, listen <laughs> to the story. Run before you're dead. Yeah, I, I actually um, have a, a giant post-it note. For everybody who can't see this, what I actually do in order to figure out where I want to talk about something in Evan's book is I just place post-it notes in the top of my book. And uh, this one says, no effing way. And it was where you were in those uh, those submerged tubes. Oh, yeah. That's the thing I wish OCR would quit because that I hate it. <laughs> yeah, so one one of the tubes at Dirt Runner, you actually, I mean, due to the rainfall, it's like almost full, right? So like, I mean, there there's a gap. You can see there's a gap of air, but you can't you can't turn your head that way. You'd have to like go through on your back with like your lips touching the the top of this like corrugated metal tube, right? So you you essentially go under, and then like do a stroke, and you kind of swim through it. But the thing is, what, what, it's not like you can do a full stroke, right? Because you're in a tube, so your arms hit the side. So you kind of do these like little. People, you can't see my arm motions here, but like I'm waving my, <laughs> I'm waving my uh, hands by my face. Um, but yeah, and you, you know, you're only only for a couple of seconds. But you know, when your your heart rate's going and there are frogs jumping off, you, bouncing off your face, you know, it uh, it amps the anxiety up a little bit. That reminds me of something you said. Like I think it was last week uh, that really stuck with me. Where you're like, nobody likes heights. It was like apparently oh, no. nobody likes uh, nobody likes to be you know like confined. Right. But there is I cannot I would rather jump off a cliff than dive into a tube with water, <laughs> like completely in it. No. Yeah, I mean no we talked we, we talked about me blacking out at dive school, and some of the military training you go to right like they purposely put you in uncomfortable situations, and one of them is in closed spaces right. So like I've hung out in a box for a while. Not pleasant. <laughs> Not pleasant. <laughs> and then there was a, like during one of the um, the uh, the nasty neck. It's an obstacle course for special forces. I was in the back of the line, and one of the obstacles is a it's a long tube. Uh, they basically like j- they just keep putting people in there, right? So th- there's this tube, and it's got like twenty dudes in there, and you're number like eight, right? So like you can't move, and there's it's it's complete pitch black because the people are blocking the light. That's like one of the only times that I've been in some place where I've been like, all right, I'm not freaking out right now. I was like, but I can really see how people could freak out, right? Like, it wasn't, it wasn't a good feeling. It was just like, yeah, I could see freaking out. I, I understand claustrophobia. That was the first time in my life I could understand claustro- claustrophobia. I was like, all right, this yeah. makes sense to me now. There's a lot of, of like fear-based obstacles. Like that are, that, that are uh, now that I think about it, it's, it's something about OCR that's kind of special is that it's not just about the physical challenge. It, it can also be about like overcoming like that, those sort of mental barriers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tough Mudder builds their whole brand on fear, right? Electricity, heights, water, and closed spaces, right? Like that's, that's what Tough Mudder does. And then even, but even all the, uh, the series do it to some extent, right? You have to climb over stuff that's high. You have to swing across things elevated above the water or ab- above the ground. You know, I think, People who handle that well or have taught themselves to handle it well, because I think anyone can teach themselves to handle it well, stop seeing it as a big deal. But when you bring in people from other sports into OCR, all of a sudden they, they get upset, right? Because like, well, I didn't sign up for heights. I didn't sign up for diving into water I can't see the bottom of. I didn't, and then like little things, right? Like if you're a road runner, you're not used to having rocks in your shoe when you run, right? Like yeah. I've, run, I've run for hours with rocks in my shoe. You just get in there. You just keep running. It's uncomfortable. <laughs> right? And I've stopped to take out rocks in my shoe probably less than five times out of all the races I've done. What? Because it's just been – like it's been something just so huge that it's been digging at my foot. But other than that, I usually just kind of shimmy my leg around and slide it between 
the curling of my toe, right? So like, yeah, you know that gap. You just kind of yeah. shimmy the little rocks up there, and you're fine. But again, road runners don't they don't like that. They don't like being covered in mud. And then nobody covered... does though. Just back to your your yeah. point, like you nobody likes that. That's what makes OCR special. Yeah. You're covered in mud and your own urine, right? You just keep. <laughs> somebody else's urine somebody else's urine because you swam after them in the, in the pool right i think about that every time <laughs> don't open your mouth <laughs> what is this oh oh something else too you talked about gun time versus line time i don't even know what this is right so the gun gun time comes from when a race starts and they fire the gun and people start running so that the time the gun that's the that's the the gun time right but okay yeah chip time is the chip uh, is on your the electronic timing chip right so if i'm in the first if i'm if i'm one of the last people across the line it's gonna take me a couple seconds to get from the back of the pack to that starting line so that's your chip time starts when you cross the line your gun time starts when the gun is fired when the starting thing goes off right so for overall placement they always use gun time because otherwise it would be confusing because you would have someone could come in first and then someone could come in second and the guy, even the guy coming in second can have a faster chip time, but they always go placement by gun time. Right. Um, so that so, was a close race. Yeah. So what had happened at Louisville, it was, I did at CTG right after OCR America and I was just completely trashed. My body was just completely trashed. I was in like 15th place, which is low for me at a CTG. I got passed by Ashley. I got passed by Brenna. Then we hit stairway to heaven and I passed both of them. And then I went from like, they had all the hardest obstacles right at the end, right? So like Z-Beam, Tarzan Swing, uh, Five Walls, and Pegatron, like all in a row. And I went from 15th to third, and me and uh, Tyler, one of uh, Lucas's friends, sprinted for the line. And I mean, we were, you can see the picture in the book, right? I mean, we're 20 feet from the line, and the two of us are right next to each other. It was close. And I ended up, like, like we said, I ended up beating him uh, according to gun time. But he was actually he had a faster chip time because he was farther back in the starting corral. Man, glad you were out the front at the beginning yeah. of the race. Yeah, yeah. Nice. We've already moved on to the second chapter. I'll let you take back over there. <laughs> oh yeah. So jumping in, so that was 2016, our first fundraiser for Folds of Honor. 2017, I was actually planning on taking a break from the crazy ideas for a year, and then just like a couple things lined up really well with my moving schedule that I could go to the. 24 hour race in Australia. Then Terrain Race announced they're going to do a 24 hour race. And Miles Keller from Link Endurance was like, Hey, you want to come out and be on our team? I think we can win. And I was like, And then things just started lining up. And I was like, All right, well, let's just do it this year. So the plan was to do every 24 hour OCR in the world. Didn't quite pan out exactly that way because I ended up, there's one in Belgium that I didn't even know about until like two years ago. Um, and then I ended up uh, deciding not to do the Spartan one. Uh, just because I'd, I'd had enough at that point. But and that, like along the way, the, the plan was just to do pretty well in all of them. And along the way, I ended up doing really well in the four in the U.S. So, uh, you know, Terrain Race, Shell Hell, Dirt Runner, and uh, World's Toughest Mudder. That was the year me and Wesley were Team Merrill. Merrill, man. Good shoes. So that was, you know, like I talked about with coming numbing myself to the eight-hour distance. Numbing myself to the 24-hour distance was a lot harder. That was is mentally that takes a lot out of you um, do you numb yourself to that not really i don't <laughs> that's like a you're working against a lot of biological processes there like 24 hours like i mean tell me you took poop breaks no, i don't i don't poop during race we you don't poop this even during a 24 no i drink mostly liquid calories i told you my body clears out everything out beforehand so i've only like i said i've only pooped once during a i pooped during the terrain relay because we were stopping right Right. But right. I'm not on the course, right? I'm in the pit and I'm waiting for my turn to run the relay. Oh man, 24 hours of that pooping sounds, I mean, anyway, <laughs> that sounds horrendous to me. That's a bad day. <laughs> it's like you're, you're drinking mostly liquid and I just emptied everything out beforehand. So it's not a problem. <laughs> oh man, got to get regular. Get you yeah. some Metamucil. I am regular. <laughs> some, uh, some Fibrocon. I, I had a... Uh, from one of my deployments, I had a, a squad leader. Every day I went to do the mission briefing for our mission, he'd be, he'd be taking a dump every day. And I'd be like, dude, I was like, what do you, why are you always, he's like, I, I drink my Metamucil in the morning. He's like, <laughs> and then I have to go to the bathroom right now. I was like, 
back it up 15 minutes, man. Back it up 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. like, I have to repeat the stupid briefing every time. <laughs> Drive me crazy. It's gonna happen, man. It's, like, it's, it's for mental clarity. It's good luck. I mean, so people, people talk about, I, I never did this, but people talked about taking combat dumps, right? Like yeah. the, the concept is, right, if you get something blows up or uh, you get scared really bad, like theoretically you can piss your pants or take a dump, right? So yeah. people are like, oh, I got to take my combat dump so I don't crap my pants on patrol. <laughs> I've never seen it happen to anyone. But <laughs> we used people- to do that on tour, like uh, for shows. Like um, you, you, you spend all, if, you, if you've ever been like, uh, like it's music. I used to play music for a living. So like for, for about a decade, you, your entire day was focused around about 40 minutes of playing music. But the rest of the day, you just sat in a van and then you, you know, you, you, you pulled all your stuff onto the stage. So it's like you would only poop whenever you told yourself you had to. And it was like right before a show because like it's the first time you've moved in the in that whole day. So you're like, did you go? Did you go? Did you go? If you didn't, like, you know that someone's going to play poorly because they're going to be like, hold it in and like all scrunched up. And like, you want to make sure, you know, you want to make sure you do that before something happens. You see, you can condition your, you can condition your body to – essentially poop on command so really it's possible we need to talk about i mean it's not like i like i'm not like i I need to poop right right like right now but you know (laughs) if the proper things are in alignment like i have a race coming up my body knows you got to clear house right you don't want to be carrying an extra weight around the course (laughs) and you did clear house you did really well to that grand slam yeah i did a lot better than i thought i was going to do one of the problems you know that we was in the book was it was on uh, – we're not going to talk about it much this episode, but that was the same year they were doing CBS Toughest Mudder. So I made this big plan to do all these 24-hour races, and then Tough Mudder's like, we're doing an eight-hour race series. It's going to be on CBS. And then I was like, oh. And then after the first one, I was like, hey, you know, I'll kind of take it – I'll try my best, but, you know, that won't be my A race. And I came in 10th, and then they're like, oh, we want to interview on you for CBS. And then I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like oh well now i have to make this my a race and the ultra ocr grand slam kind of my b so it was um it really threw a wrench into things you know it was it was a it was very, i was very fortunate to be in that position especially because that was really the only year they did the uh cbs coverage for the toughest mutters yeah and, um you know i'm glad i i adjusted some things in my schedule to make sure i could be part of the interviews and I got a little bit of TV time, which was kind of cool. Going through high school, at, if we were like, all right, one person on this cross-country team is going to be on interviewed <laughs> as an athlete on CBS, I'd be like, well, it's definitely not me. Right. No, I'd, be like, <laughs> I'd be the last person picked. So that was seeing that kind of pan out that way is just incredibly wild. So, they showed those interviews too tight, too. They didn't show your pecs, man. I know. And they just like weren't showing like your your physique. Yeah, it's because a lot of people you're you're not supposed to wear any sort of logos, but some people don't listen, so mm-hmm. they I think they they crop them all that way just to avoid any sort of possible logos. Those were uncomfortably close. I remember watching that and she's like, what? <laughs> "Why would you do that to anybody? <laughs> Nobody." <laughs> anyway, dude, that's that's awesome. You did all of that, and then you finished, and it's like now what? Yeah, so you know with with these ultra OCR ideas, you're getting them one year at a time, right? So I announce them and a couple months later I do them, right? I know what I'm doing three years out. It's already planned, right? So just because you're not hearing about it doesn't mean it doesn't, it doesn't exist, right? So all my plans, I know what I'm doing the next three years at pretty much at all times. And it, you know, it, sometimes it fluctuates slightly and I flip-flop years and stuff like that. Like I said, the ultra OCR guy in slam got moved up to 2017 and, um, what I do for 2018 for the next episode. And we'll talk, like, we'll talk a little bit more about Toughest Mudder in the next episode. It was a busy year. I mean, I, yeah. my wife is a saint there, just trucking around with her and my daughter, right? Who was like two at the time, right? Flying to Australia, which is like a 16 hour flight, preposterous so long. Driving around Australia, you know, your, your child's not understanding why she's upset because she doesn't understand time zone changes. You know, it's like all these problems that you don't even think about. And then at the same time, she's trying to support me and I'm a complete mess, right? Because you don't, like, I'm not very functional after a 24-hour race. Yeah. The despondency. And the uh, the one in Australia, I had such bad chafage too. Oh. I had such bad chafage that I ended up 
walking around in just my dry robe after the race. Right. So like completely nude underneath. Oh yeah. <laughs> Everything shaved so bad. So I was like, I had a, I think I had a t-shirt on and nothing else and a dry robe. <laughs> and that's how I, ch- that's how I checked into the hotel, like a flasher. I was like, mm-hmm. Oh God, I wanted to do that during OCRA too so badly as well, dude. You were like, you were warning me. You were like, you're going to chafe. And that first day I didn't put any squirrels nut butter on. And so by day three, I was like, I want to take off my pants, but there's just a bunch of dudes and I don't know half of them super well. <laughs> Again, so if bad. If you're in the army, I've, I mean, there's just a bunch of naked dudes running around. I'm, I've seen more than my than I care to see <clears throat> in my lifetime. <laughs> Dude, how did it feel to like finish like that grand slam? Like, how did you feel like after it was over? Good. I mean, I was just on cloud nine because we we did so well at World's Toughest Mudder in the team division, you know. And again, I not something I ever saw myself uh, being on the podium for. Um, at, at world toughest, so um, you know, even on the team division, I never, I never thought I'd be in the team division podium. So that was just a great experience, and it was, um, I was just super happy things, things lined up that way. So we, I mean, we get through those races. Do you want to talk about some of the injuries from OCR America and the OC, and the and the Grand Slam that were pretty interesting? You know, I didn't have any kind of major injuries from either one. It's just a lot of little nagging things. On day six, I talked about it. This is how the book starts, right? I fall and just slam my hip. And I was really worried that that was going to, like, I seriously hurt something. But um, it turns out I didn't. It's a lot of little nagging things that, you know, are bothering you at the time. But, again, in hindsight, like, nothing really sticks out too much. While I was training in the off season before Ultra OCR Grand Slam, I went to do weighted dips and just tore the pec right off right off of the uh the bone there um so i was doing i was doing a lot of weight um which but i always did used to do a lot of weight um i hadn't done it in like the last month or two so maybe that was that was probably my error but right i I go down you know i do set of dips 45 pounds set of dips with 90 pounds throw 135 on there which i've done dozens and dozens of times and i went down on like rep two or three and it just i could i felt muscle ripping it was wild and I fall to the ground and I was like, I just did something stupid. And then I'm like, I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I go to do a push up and just fall on my face. And then I'm like, I go to the locker room and I sit there kind of upset at myself. And then I go home and um, I'm like, I should work out some more. Cause that's what, <laughs> that's what a normal person does after they tear their pack. Yeah. Right? So I got on the exercise bike and biked for 30 minutes. And then my wife came home and I was like, ah, I'm pretty sure I tore my pack or my bicep or something. Um, I felt something rip and sure enough um, what was interesting was it tore from the, the, you know, the upper arm bone. So that actually the blood was pulling in the bicep and because there was so much swelling going on, you couldn't tell that I tore something until the swelling went down. So now if I do like a, a most muscular pose, you can see a piece of my pec is missing on the you know, kind of the right, right by my armpit. Oh, you never but, got it reattached. No, no. So I mean, it was. Uh, How come? <clears throat> it wasn't a complete, in the military. It wasn't a complete like the guy was like, yeah, it didn't like the entire muscle didn't tear away. It was part of the muscle tore away, and part of it was still kind of hanging on. So like, yeah, we could go in there and start messing around with it. And I was like, eh, let's just leave it. So luckily, we don't use chest too much in OCR. So <laughs> my bench is still atrocious. My bench is still like embarrassing, but so it's probably about the same as mine. <laughs> you know i used to do i used to, i mean i i i i can't do 225 anymore i can't i can't oh, okay that. so never mind but yeah and I'd, I'd be scared too because i could when i can feel like the scar tissue when i when i bench still dang dude that's crazy you, you hurt your hip you tore your pack wide open who knows the mental damage you've done <laughs> <laughs> probably torn a few brain cells yeah you had to have to, to try something like the ocr Grand slam, dude. Yeah, and that the the one event we kind of want to touch on real quick was the the Shell Hill one. I ended up doing that one as a shadow run because it was the same date as the Toughest Mudder, and CBS wanted to interview me, and I was like, well, I'm not going to turn that down. So I went to the Toughest Mudder, but a month before that, I did the Shell Hill event essentially on my own because it's a permanent course. So I went up there, and um, that was a rough day also because about. 11 hours or 12 hours into it, I was like, what am I doing? It's like, no one even cares, right? Like, 
It's like, what is this? And I was just so miserable because you're by yourself. You know, part of the, what makes World's Tough as fun is the interactions, the people. You're sharing each other's misery, right? It's a competition. I'm just out there by myself, log miles, and it's hot. It is, you know, like July or June. I can't remember what, what month it was. Oh, dude. You didn't have a, you didn't have pacers or anything? July 20. No. So I, I emailed, I messaged a bunch of the Noob Sanity people who are not, they're, they're still pretty far, but like Logan, who uh, you didn't meet, but you know, they were busy. There was another, I think there was another race going on that weekend too in the Northeast. So a lot of other people were going to that. You know, most of my friends, most of my friends are in the Midwest. So that run OCR. And I can't remember what Stye was doing that weekend. He had something going on where he couldn't make it. Talk about MVPing, dude. That guy getting up and, uh, and running laps with you after driving all night long. That's insane stuff. Yeah, he's a trooper. He, he literally prevented us from dying on the first OCR America. <laughs> well, that was crazy. What a ride, man. Yeah. So when you do it again, what are you going to change? Are we gonna are we gonna do it with walkers? Are we gonna have a? Are we gonna scoot around? An ultra an ultra OCR Grand Slam again? Yeah. <sighs> you know, most a lot of these events don't even happen anymore, right? So I mean, terrain re- terrain race is gone. Uh, Midwest Mayhem Twenty Four, the Dirt Runner One is gone. Shell Hell is gone. So the, right now, there's World's Toughest Mudder. There's Enduro, which is in Australia still. Uh, there's the Belgium race I mentioned, the Extreme Twenty Four, and the Platinum Ring just started a Twenty Four last year i could actually do it again and it would be different venues and interesting right so spartan assuming they they come back with their 24-hour race um i think there's i could do that one again but again i'm not really flying to australia is pretty expensive that's not cheap and there's some other place i want to go see i do want to do that belgium race though i think that'll be that would be fun you know with all these things i hope i'm not the only person that does it historically like i would love to see a couple of, you know, a couple of years from now, someone like I'm better than Evan. I can do, I can do nine days of OCR America and different venues and go run further or something. I would, I think that's, that'd be super cool. I would love to see that. Like, Cause then you'd have to come out and do 10. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I just think it's, I think it's the, the point is always to push yourself. Right. And if I can push someone else um, in a similar fashion, and I think it creates, especially if you get a good marketing team behind it, right? Like the, the amount of coverage we got in OCR America 2 and the amount of donations we got was so much better than the first one. I mean, we doubled the amount of money we raised uh, because of your videos and because we had Mike Stefano's awesome podcast coverage. I see he edited those episodes so good and like spliced everything together. So, you know, and I think if you get a, a real big company with a real big reach behind you, you can really spread the sport really well. And that's what it needs right now, like especially coming out of 2020. Especially with just like, you know, the changing winds of just the way that the public's and, and athletes, you know, sort of ideas of what's interesting and what's new. Like that's always going to change, especially with something that's as mutable as a sport like OCR, where every event is different and every series is different. Yeah. It's time for the next new thing already. Right. Some brands will have the same obstacles all year long and people complain. They'll be like, well, we have the same obstacles. And you're like, this is within the same year. I don't know what you were expecting. <laughs> <laughs> It's like you're not supposed to drive around the country to all the races and do all of them, but people do because it's fun. I think we do pretty as a sport as overall, we do pretty well at adapting, uh, but I think we can always do better, right? Like the Spartan games thing this year was super cool. Yeah. I just finished watching the last episode. It was phenomenal. Uh, Thomas Van Tonder. I got to send you this link, Bobby. Also Um, did 90 meter rope climb and Red Bull TV covered it. So no. Yeah. Whoa. A 15 minute documentary. If anyone wants to go check out Red Bull TV, it's called Rising with the Sun. But I think stuff like that is just really phenomenal. He does something like that, and people are like, this dude's doing what? And then they're like, he's a what now? An OCR athlete? What's that? And then theoretically, they've heard of your sport at that point, you know? But yeah. And I think the Spartan, did you watch the Spartan games? No, I just like, I just like saw some of like the, yeah. the highlight stuff on YouTube, like some of the commentary, and listened to Mike's podcast. Yeah. I think it really shows. I think as OCR athletes, we always undersell ourselves in general, right? We'll be like, oh, because I know a dude that can run faster than me, right? Or I know a dude who can do the obstacles better than me, right? Ninja Warrior guys can do obstacles better. The guys who can do a running ultra marathons can do running better. The OCR athlete is a really well-rounded person who can do a lot of things like at a pretty high level. Yeah. And I think if you watch the Spartan games, they really emphasize that because you have 
football players, you have ultra runners, triathletes, these people who are supposed to be like very fit. And some of them are just bombing some of these events because it's just, it's just way outside their comfort zone. And then on top of that, like we talked earlier with the mental grit, some of them are just not used to, you know, if you're a road runner, you're not used to having mud in your shoes. You're not used to dealing with the elements when you're trying to um, do some of these obstacles and doing an obstacle in the rain is significantly different than uh, just kind of going for a run in the rain. It's uh, amps up the difficulty. It makes things a little more tricky. You got to change your technique and stuff like that. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's a big reason why this sport is amazing. I agree. Yeah. I'm, I'm obviously biased. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, OCR is about overcoming whatever it is that scares you or uh, is th- the most challenging. Like, like every one of us has something that we, that we do really well and probably many things that we don't do well. And every time you go out on the course, you get up, the sun's rising, you're like, okay, I have to deal with all of those things. And I get to be just a little bit better at one of them. And so the, the, men- the feeling of like mental satisfaction is higher than anywhere else. I agree with that. So that kind of takes us through chapters 10 and 11. And obviously, the actual book, we we dive deep into every one of those events, right? Every day of OCR America 1 and every one of the 24-hour races I did in 2017. You know, in this commentary, we gloss over a lot of the events. If you want the full story, you got you to pick up the book, either hard copy digital or audiobook format. Because I dive into basically every day of OCR America. We talk about it in depth, the specific obstacles and stuff like that. And then going into the ultra OCR grand slam. We talked through those events more in depth. So we just kind of hit the wave tops there, but so with endurance sports, there becomes like a tipping point. And you know, when you first get involved in endurance sports, you're like, Oh, I want to tell everyone all the crazy stuff I'm doing. Look how I ran a marathon. Look how cool I am. Right. And you get the t-shirt and every, you got to show everyone you post on social media with endurance sports. There becomes a tipping point where it's almost becomes embarrassing. And around 2016, like I kind of hit that tipping point (laughs) where like I didn't want to tell people because people start looking at you like there's something wrong with you, right? So I remember going to the the army has a lot of these, um, you know, they could test like body fat and VO2 max and some other stuff, access to some pretty cool equipment. And I went in 2017 uh, in the middle of the ultra ultra OCR Grand Slam. And the woman who's like operating the thing is asking me questions about my fitness and blah, blah, blah. And I eventually, because I'm like, well, I'm doing some 24-hour obstacle course races. She's like, what do you mean you're doing a couple? I was like, she's like, how many are you doing? And I was like, all of them. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what? You know, then you have to like explain, like people look at you like you're the range. You're like, this is, you know, it turns into, instead of just being like, go about your day, you have to start explaining what obstacle course racing is and then explain what ultra distance obstacle course racing is and then explain why I'm on the fringe of the fringe, <laughs> right? Like I'm, I'm at the very, very edge of like where people think it's socially acceptable and what I'm doing. So, you know, 2016 with OCR America and uh, 2017, that I definitely hit that tipping point. And I love talking OCR with the OCR people, right? Because they understand. I don't have to start from square one we can get into like deeper topics but yeah you know, the average person they need you had to start from square one and it becomes like a it becomes almost an ordeal well i love it you know and i was the same way i mean when i ran, ran my first 10 miler right i was like no one runs 10 miles in a single day <laughs> that's insane look at my look at my shirt i'm wearing around college i'm insane <laughs> you know like and then eventually you're just like uh eh. I think you should tally up all of, you know, how everybody has like a 26.2 bumper sticker or whatever. I think you should tally up uh, all the mileage you do in a year and just put that on your shirt. And it's just like this ridiculously long number. People are like, what's that? And you're just like, you'd know if you were there. So the one thing I did tally up was the amount of time I physically spent on obstacle course races since 2014. And it's, I think I'm at 29 days, right? So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 29 cumulative days of my life. I spent slipping through the woods, climbing over things. <laughs> 29 days, you'll never get back. I can't get that back. It's, over, it's gone. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to take off. Um, next time, we're going to dive into Tough as Mudder a little bit more in depth. I know we talked about a little bit about it this episode and kind of Endure the Gauntlet uh, lead up and then into Endure the Gauntlet, which is kind of the big, big finale of the book there. Yeah. Well, it's, until the, you know, the next edition. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not all the right. crazy stuff you've done since then. <laughs> that's why I have you, Bobby. You're just making movies out of stuff. Yeah. Well, that's coming sooner than people may think, but later than I had hoped for. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're going to get going. Any final shout outs you want to give, Bobby? Uh, yeah. I want to thank my mom mm. and my dad 
and my sisters for dealing with me and Thursday for being there when I wake up tomorrow. I love it. All right, we'll catch you later and tune in next time. Make sure you pick up a copy of the book. Make sure you go and check out Stoke Shed and some of their awesome videos and we will we'll catch you later. Love y'all.